Hi, welcome to another session of the Potter's Roundtable from Washington Street Studios, where spring refuses to come to Bolivar, West Virginia. I'm Phil Bernberg, and today's topic is firing schedules, and this is a topic that was suggested by one of our YouTube viewers. Welcome to the Potter's Roundtable, a monthly podcast where we share our passion for the ceramic arts and a collection of topics specific to potters. Remember to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Enjoy the show. Okay, so firing schedules. A firing schedule is a description of the heating rates and the temperatures during a firing up to the final temperature. And firing schedules are also called firing curves or firing programs or firing cycles. And, and on this next chart, basically it shows that Firing schedules can really be described as a graph, such as this right here, that basically shows the different segments or the different portions of the firing, the different heating rates during those portions and the temperatures, or it can be described as a chart that's basically sh showing the same information where you have a certain portion of the firing with a certain heating rate up to a certain temperature, and then you change the heating rate up to another temperature and so forth, which it's giving you the same information basically that the, the graph is showing you, but it's in numerical form, so it might be a little easier to read, you know, a little read quickly. And there are several general types of schedules that we can look at on this next chart that just sort of, they're not, this, this isn't meant to be 100% accurate, this is just sort of diagrammatically showing the, some of the differences, like a bisque firing with a slow initial heat up, and a, what I'm calling stoneware here is basically a, gla a high temperature glazed firing where you can heat up faster, or a crystalline glaze where you can have, also have the same faster heat up, but then you drop down and you hold that temperature, and a raku firing which is very fast up and down. This is just a sort of a general characterization of them. And so let's let's talk about let's go into these some of these general features of these different the different cycles and different types a little bit more. Basically, a bisque firing you have slow heating early on in the firing to complete the drying essentially because um, you, you you can assume that in a bisque firing the clay is probably not completely dry, and then you also want slow heating up to around 1,100 degrees Fahrenheit. This is where the chemical water is being removed. So you still have to go slowly because, as you're probably aware, there's about 14% water, chemical water, in the clay. That's a lot of water that has to come off, and you can't drive it off too quickly. And then finally, once you get up to around 1100 degrees, then you can, you can heat at a faster rate to the final temperature. That's sort of general features of a, of a bisque firing. For a glaze firing, you might also want to have a, a drying segment early on. For instance, if you're, if you're not sure that all the water from applying the glazes has dried out of the pots, you might want to include an early drying segment. But then you can, take, you can do fairly rapid heating up to around 200 degrees of the final temperature because at this point, nothing's happening to the glaze. The only thing that's happening is you're heating the clay. And then when you finally get within 100 or 200 degrees of the final temperature, then you want to slow down again during the glaze firing until an hour left time for the glaze to mature. Now again, these are some general characteristics. We'll talk a little bit later about you know, some of the things that might affect the, these, these generalities. On a crystalline glaze or a macro crystalline glaze firing, basically the only difference from that and any other kind of glaze firing is that now you have a, con a controlled cooling section. So you might, after, the, after you reach peak temperature, you might drop down several hundred degrees and then go into a hold for a while. And it's during this hold that the crystals are actually growing. When the, when the, when the glaze is really fluid at the maximum temperature, Crystals are not, act, are not apt to form, so you have to actually let it cool a a little, off a little bit. But the glaze still has to be liquid. The crystals can't form once the glaze solidified. So you've dropped it down a little bit in temperature, you allow the crystals to form, and then you allow it to cool down further, and basically then the glaze freezes with the crystals in it. In a raku firing, basically you, can ha you have very rapid heating up just to melt the glaze, and you might, because very often with raku firings, you're actually looking at the pots and observing the glazes to see how the melt, melting is progressing. You might even have a hold once you get up to the approximate temperature um, just to sort of observe the glazes and make sure they're melting. And then when you remove the pots from the kiln, you have extremely rapid cooling, for several hundred degrees, you know, just a couple of minutes. 
And then usually when you put them into the, in the, into the combustibles, you might bury them in sawdust or whatever, then the cooling rate slows down again because the pot is a little more insulated by the, the sawdust or whatever the combustibles are. But it's still a very rapid process. And then finally, one thing I didn't show in these charts here is a single firing. And in a single firing, basically, you can't avoid a bisque firing portion. So you still have a slow initial heat up up to about the bisque temperature, as if you were do doing a bisque firing. But then at that point, when you get close to the final temperature, you can accelerate the heating and continue on with the more rapid heating that you would in a glazed firing. Still slowing down at the end to allow time for the glaze to mature. Now, one, one important point to make here is these are sort of the general types of firings. There is no universal perfect schedule for each type of firing because the specific, meaning that you can't pick, let's say, one bisque firing schedule necessarily and have that good for all situations because the heating rates and the amount of time it takes to heat to get to a certain temperature depend on a number of factors. And these include things like just the type of clay. How dense is the clay? How, in other words, how easily is it, how easy is it going to be for all the impurities and the gases to come out of the clay? This, and this relates to things like, does the clay have grog in it or not? How clean is the clay? Does it have a lot of impurities, let's say a lot of sulfur and contamination in it, or a lot of maybe sulfides or other organic materials that have to burn off? And so if it does, if it's sort of a dirty clay, then it's gonna take longer and probably should be fired more slowly to get rid of all those impurities. And even with a glaze firing, depending on how vitrified you want the clay to be, when you're doing a glaze firing, the glaze might be mature, it might be fine, but, but you might need to adjust the firing for the clay if the clay is not, not getting vitrified enough during that scheduling. So you need to consider for a glaze firing what's happening to the clay as well as what's happening to the glaze. And then other factors such as the size of the work and the thickness of the work. If you have massive pieces with very thick sections, then obviously for, for either a, a bisque firing or a glaze firing, you're going to have to slow the firing down and allow more time for the firing to proceed so you get, so you get uniform temperatures across these sections. The initial dryness of the piece affects it. Again, if you have a thick piece that starts off, and it may feel dry when you, when you put it into the kiln, but if you have a very thick section, there could be a lot of moisture trapped inside, and without knowing for sure whether there is or not, you need to allow for that. The type of glaze affects even the firing. Certain glaze chemistries, certain recipes, require longer time to mature. So you can't just, let's say for cone six glaze, you can't necessarily take all cone six glazes just up to cone six and call that the end of the firing. Some of them might require a little more time at cone six or around cone six for the, the ingredients to actually react and for the glaze to mature. And even things like the stacking of the kiln and the shelf loading can affect the firing. So that, for instance, if you had a kiln that was stacked fairly loosely and the shelves were fairly wide apart, that presumably could fire a lot more quickly, could respond more quickly than a tightly packed kiln with close shelves. So you might, if you, you might have to change the, the, for the same pots, but in two different loadings, you might have to change the firing to accommodate that. And even the type of kiln can have an effect because, for instance, with electric kilns, you can get pretty good control of the temperature, at least wherever you're measuring it. But with gas and especially wood kilns, you don't have as precise control over the temperatures, especially at lower temperatures. So for, if you were, let's say you were bisque firing in a gas kiln, you'd have to proceed a lot more cautiously to make sure you didn't get too hot too quickly. So all of these things, aside from sort of the general pattern of the firing schedules, you have to allow for these other sort of variables. And one other point to mention is that if you're really thinking, what you really like to achieve is the most efficient firing, not necessarily the fastest, but the most efficient, meaning the, uh, so the point is, what you wanna do is you can't heat too quickly unless you know what's happening during that portion of the firing. So you have to know what's happening, when can you heat up safely and not cause any harm, and when do you need to slow down because there's something you have to take into consideration. The final temperatures for, for bisque temperature for bisque firings are less sensitive generally than for glaze firings. So for bisque firings, the final temperature, assuming that you've gone well above the point where the chemical water is being driven off and you've cleaned up most of the impurities, the final temperature really only affects the strength of the bisque ware and the porosity, how, much, how porous it is. 
And, and generally, even several cones don't make that much difference. And the main effect you're going to, the two main effects you might see would be how fragile the work is in terms of handling. So for instance, porcelain, bisque fired at 010, is apt to be a lot more fragile and delicate than the same porcelain bisque fired at 06, in terms of how careful you have to be when you're, when you're glazing it, or like if you bump it or that sort of thing. And the other thing, the glaze absorption, as you heat, as you heat clay to a higher temperature, a higher bisque temperature, it gets denser and denser, and so it tends to absorb less glaze. So that two pots that are fired at different bisque temperatures, the one that's fired at the lower bisque temperature will absorb more glaze in the same period of time than one that's fired at a higher temperature because it has more porosity. So that's, that's the effect you might see. I've seen kilns, for instance, that didn't have downdraft vents on them and where there was a considerable difference, maybe even a one or two cone difference between the top and the bottom of the kiln, you could see that when you went to glaze the pots. If you dip them, if you have a certain routine, a certain you know, time or, or sort of pattern that you use, you, you dip the pot, one pot in the glaze and, and get a certain coating, and then you dip a pot from another part of the bisque firing in the glaze, and you could see the difference in the coating that you got. And that was due to the absorption of the, the pottery because of the difference in the, in the bisque temperature. For glaze temperature, for glaze firings, Lower temperature glazes tend to be generally more temperature sensitive than high temperature glazes, meaning that for, a low, for the lower temperature glaze, like cone six compared to cone 10, or especially earthenware, you have to get much closer to the sort of the target temperature for that glaze to get the glaze to mature. Or another way to say it, to turn it around is, as you go to higher temperature glazes, the temperatures are less sensitive, so they're, they're more tolerant of temperature variations. So a cone 10 glaze might work just fine at cone 9, all the way up to cone 12. A cone 6 glaze might be maybe a half a cone either way and, and still be okay. And an earthenware glaze, is, you're probably going to have to hit it right on whatever the designated cone for that, for that glaze is. So in this case, it's probably, you're probably going to see more sensitivity in a glaze firing with temperature than you would in a bisque firing. That's the point. And the other point to make is that not all glazes that are shown or indicated for the same cone actually require the same cone. So that when they say a glaze is designated as a cone six glaze, that doesn't mean that that glaze is going to fire perfectly at cone six. It might do a lot better at five or five and a half, or it might do a little better at a hot six, like six and a half or seven. So they're just, they're sort of more of a nominal designation. This is a quote unquote cone six glaze, or this is a quote unquote cone 10 glaze. But this is something you have to work out. And this is why when you're firing a kiln and you have a number of different glaze recipes in the kiln at the same time, some of them make, for one firing, some of them may come out perfectly and others a little less so because you haven't quite hit the perfect temperature for that glaze. One other thing to mention also is that we generally, we don't talk about it a lot, but cooling is an important part of some glaze firings, depending what the glaze recipe is. If glazes tend to crystallize during slow cooling, then controlling the cooling can have a big effect on the, uh, on the appearance of the glaze because by cooling it slowly, you allow more crystals to form. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, subscribe, and share it with your friends. And consider becoming a patron of our channel. Visit www.patreon.com and search for the Potter's Roundtable. Any amount you give will support the creation of a digital library of educational videos and podcasts to support artists, potters, and educators now and into the future. If you would like more information about our membership studio, classes, events, and multimedia productions at Washington Street Studios, visit our website at www.hfclay.com. One thing, one other point I'd like to make also is that you really should look, if you're, if you're working on developing a schedule, or even if you're doing your normal work, it's a good idea to look at the pots while they're still in the kiln after a firing, because this is an easy way to spot problems, is that if, if you can notice something that has happened, let's say it's a glaze firing, and you find pots that the glaze isn't perfectly as satisfactory, there's an important piece of information as to where was it in the kiln. Was it on the outside of the kiln? Let's say an electric kiln near the elements. If it was a gas kiln, was it closer to the bag wall, to the burners? So this is an additional bit of information that can help you sort of diagnose the problem. We've got, here are some, a couple of actual examples of 
firing schedules. And so in this next, these are a series of charts that were taken off from, uh, they were taken from, on, from the website, hotkilns.com, which is for LNL kilns. And I'm not gonna go through these in detail, but this is the kind of information that you can very readily get online. Just about all the kiln manufacturers produce this type of information for their kilns. And you may even, if you look at them, for instance, these are profiles for, for an 04, for a basically an, a low firing, either a low, a, low, a low glaze firing or for a bisque. And you may, if you compare them from different manufacturers, they're not necessarily gonna be identical, but they'll give you an idea. If you're looking for, you know, maybe how to set up a schedule, you can just use these as reference. So if we look at the next one, like this is an 04 temperature, and you can see in the, they indicate like slow and medium and different, different heating rates. This information is also, it's called cone fire because most electric kilns produced or offer two different type of firings, what they call cone fire, where all you really do is pick the cone and hit start, basically. And, it, and this, this information is already programmed into the kiln. So if you were to hit this program, the kiln is following the schedule. So this is nice because then if you have a kiln and you're doing, using cone fire mode and you don't know what's going on, you can look it up and say, okay, when I use an 04, this particular profile on my kiln, this is what's actually happening. So this is useful reference information. And I think we have a couple more here that show the same type. This is for an oat, this is for cone six, the same kind of information. And it's basically showing what the samples that we showed before that for, for the, each firing is broken down into a, a series of segments where there's a slow heating rate up to a certain temperature, and then maybe you hold it, or this, I guess this is the total time actually in this case. And then it, you change the heating rate up to another temperature, and then you slow down again up to another temperature and so forth. As I say, these are, if you compare these, even for the same nominal cone six, they're not necessarily gonna be identical from one manufacturer to another. They should have certain common features in mind, in, in, they should have certain features in common. For instance, with the bisque firing, they should be slowing down or running fairly slowly up through about 1100 degrees because that you need to do that um, to take care of the chemical water. But other than that, the specific rate, whether it was you know, 100 degrees an hour or 150 or 120, you're gonna see some, you will see some differences. Okay, and then, so those are some examples of, of some of the profiles in the chart form. Now we have an example of, of, of profiles or that we actually obtained from a fire, recording from a firing. This is from the first two firings of our soda kiln here at Washington Street Studios. And the, the, the blue chart is the first firing where we actually did a firing. We didn't put any soda in the kiln. We were really just exploring to see how the kiln fired and to test the burners and so forth. And so we've, we've got a fairly rapid temperature rise initially. And then this is where we went into reduction where the temperature dropped slightly and then we continued on up. And then the second firing that we actually did just this past March where we actually did introduce soda, we weren't trying to, we were, we were changing it a little bit compared to the first firing. And we had, we had also modified the bag wall, so we were expecting the, the kiln to respond a little differently. So again, fairly rapid heat up rate. And again, we went into, in this case, just around 1500, which is around 012, we went into the, re, into, the, into the reduction period for about an hour, and then we continued up to the final temperature. And in this case also, we were able to get better heating, and so we ended up with a shorter firing also. So now if we like, this was data actually measurements taken during the firing, but if we ended up liking, let's say, this profile, the red profile, then we could, we could use that as our guide or as our firing cycle, as our reference for future firings. So, but this, this data was actually obtained from the firing, but then it could become our guide. Okay, so some here I have, so we ha I have some suggestions here again general suggestions for 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 fire for some, for some firing schedules. So this is a suggested firing schedule bisque firing for an, a manual electric kiln that has either low, medium, high switches. This is a fairly fairly old style kiln, but there's nothing wrong with it at all. Manual kilns still work great. Or some of them some of the L and L kilns at least had a switch that you could turn it on low, and then it also went to numbers like low and then one through 10, and 10 basically was, was high. And so this is a schedule that I used a lot when I was firing with manual kilns, and it also fit, I, I believe in having a kiln firing fit your schedule, not the other way around. So this worked great, I could, I could, I could turn it on low overnight, and I'd have the lid propped up, and I'd have maybe all the peephole plugs out, and i just let it run overnight, and that would basically do a really low temperature drying cycle. And then the next morning, 
before, let's say before I went to work or at nine o'clock in the morning, I turn it up to medium and I'd let it run all day long on medium. And that's going through the period where, that includes the period where the chemical water is coming off. So it's a nice slow heating rate. And then finally, late in the afternoon or, in the, or maybe when I got home from work, I turn it up to high and let it just finish off. I'm a firm believer in the fact that you should be there at the end of the firing. Even if you're using an automatic controller and the kiln is gonna shut off, but in most cases, I actually also want to look at the cones. So I want to be there. So I've ne I personally have never had a problem with a kiln running when I'm not there up to the end, but then I want to be there at the end. So this schedule worked out great. And one of the things to, one of the, on the next, we've got another chart here that's interesting that shows what happens when you use this kind of heating on a manual kiln, because this is, this is what would happen, this is basically what, how the kiln would heat up on each one of those settings. So when you, this, this, ha this scale is, is, happens to be in centigrade, but I put some temperatures over here indicated on Fahrenheit. So when you turn it on low, it heats up fairly quickly and then it slows down and eventually, if you left it long enough, it wouldn't get any hotter. It, because the heat is only being put into the kiln at a certain rate on that low setting. And as you know, as we've talked before in some of our other presentations, the hotter you get, the, the faster the heat is being lost. So finally the kiln reaches a point where it can't get any hotter with that particular setting, and that's what this is showing. And that ends up, goes up to about 930 degrees roughly, and it, it just can't get any hotter. So in order to, to have the firing progress, then you would need to go to the next setting. So and then you'd go to medium, and that can, that again, if, same kind of shape curve. It heats up quickly, and then it slows down as it gets hotter because more and more heat is being lost. And finally that would go to about 1472. Well that's above, as I mentioned, that's above the point where the chemical water is coming off. So in that previous uh, shot where I showed you that I, I'm letting it go all day long on medium, so it would take all day long on medium, nice and slow, for the, for the chemical water to come off. And then finally, when you click it up to high, click it up high can go above, can go fairly high. In this case, above, well, you know, above cone 12 even. So somewhere long before that, you wouldn't, you, it would shut off because you wouldn't, if you're only going, let's say, you know, bisque temperature or, or even a glaze firing, it wouldn't have to be on high very long. So I found that was a very convenient schedule. But this is the way, this is the, this is the way the, the burners would work is they can only, they can only get so hot. And this is, this is the same principle applies to gas kilns, for instance, is that when you turn the burners on, if you don't change the setting on the burners, you don't either increase the gas or do something to make produce more heat eventually it reached some temperature where it simply won't get any hotter and that's that's the 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 the, the situation that people run into when they say the kiln is stalling well basically and basically electric kilns that you know even with a controller they stall except the controller is programmed that before it actually happens it kicks in more power and keeps it going okay okay so that's a, that's a suggestion for, for for manual if we go to the next one now this is a bisque temperature for either a gas-fired kiln where you're doing it more, you don't have a program, or, or you do have a program on an electric kiln where you can program in the ramp and hold. And this ramp and hold program, this is where you design your own program and you follow one of these schedules where you, you, you program in a certain heating rate up to a certain temperature, and then you change the heating rate up to another temperature and so forth. So in general, what I found works pretty well is I, I always usually include some kind of a drying or I'll call it a preheat and some kilns actually have a, electric kilns actually have a preheat uh, option on them. And in, in this case, it's important to keep it below 212, below the boiling point of water because you're basically just finishing the drying, okay? And this is still a bisque though. And then, then, and then I'm calling it the finishing the drying because all the water, even all the water in the kiln doesn't come off at the boiling point of water. There's some water in there, just some adsorbed water that has to get heated a little hotter. So I, I'm still going fairly slowly, 100 degrees an hour, up to about 250. Then I can, then I, and now I'm, I, can, I can speed it up a little bit, but now I'm going to, for the bisque, I'm going into the point where I'm gonna go through the chemical water. So I still, I go a little faster, but not that much fast, 200 degrees up to about 1100, which is, and now, I, and then I can speed it up a lot, 304 degrees, and go up to where my final temperature is. Because at this point, the water is gone, and now all I'm doing is sort of making the pottery get a little more dense and a little harder, a little stronger, okay? So then we have, we also have some, uh, an example of, of a glaze firing schedule here. So again, now we go back to the manual electric kiln, low, medium, high switches, or low cone 10. And again, 
you might want to include a, a low a drying section where, because let's say the, the glaze hasn't completely dried or you're not sure if it has, and so you want to get rid of the water that's, that was left over from the glazing. And so you might want to go up to 150, again, keeping it well below 200. And so what I've done on this sometimes is I found if I put on just one of the switches on low, that's enough to, to just get it within that range to do some drying. You can't trust, frankly, from what I've seen, you can't trust that low, or even if they call it preheat on a kiln, is necessarily below 200. You need to check it. It might be, it might be a preheat, but it might be over the boiling point. So that, in which case you wouldn't want to do that. And then you can go, once I'm, once I'm sure it's dry, this is a glaze frying now, I, can, I personally, I go fairly rapid heating, 400 degrees an hour, up to close to the final temperature, 100 degrees or 200 degrees below the final temperature. And then I want to slow down again. I'm calling it finishing here because now I have to slow down. When I get close to the final temperature, I want to, I want to go slowly enough now to allow time for the glaze to react and mature. And so I, I speed, I do a slow initially, I speed up, and then I slow down again at the end to finish off the glaze. And I think we have one more chart here for the gas-fired kiln with a ramp and hold. And the only really difference from the, previous, from the previous one is that in this case, you might want to be able to, and it's, I'm doing it here because it's a whole lot easier than to do, this is one feature that is a lot easier than on a manual kiln, is you might want to do a, a controlled cooling. And so, and firing down is a little, and it's, in the gas kiln, you could just turn down the gas, and turn, instead of turning the gas off at the end, you'd turn down a little bit and allow the temperature to drop a little bit. Or, in these ramp and hold programs, you can actually program in a section where instead of when, after the final temperature, you put in a lower temperature and then it actually goes to this lower temperature and you could have it hold or you could have a series of steps of lower temperatures to slow down the cooling. And this is where you could get some good crystallization of some glazes, okay? Okay, so I guess one, one comment that I, I've made is, or I'd like to make is that I found in general that the cone fire mode on most electric program, most programmable electric kilns, is good for most purposes. The only time for both the, both the canned, or I'm calling, you know, the, pre, the pre-programmed, the cone fire ones, for either bis firing or glaze firing, I found are, are fairly adequate. The only changes I've made to them, I might add a preheat section or a drying section, and I might add a hold at the end, but I've never really, for most of the work I made, which is, you know, sort of small standard functional or non-functional work, I've never had to completely redesign a new schedule. The only time I've had to actually use one of these design your own ramp and hold schedules is for really unusual work, like very thick, heavy sculptural work, where frankly, these, all of these programs are simply not slow enough, and they're not slow enough in the right places. So, um, but other than that, I, I, I find the, the, the cone fire mode programs are generally very good. So the only, I guess the only other comment I wanted to make was that, in spite of, I've been talking in generalities here because you really need to work out the best schedules for your particular kiln and for the kind of work that you make. The, the kind of clay that you use, the thickness of the clay, your glaze recipes and so forth. For instance, I found out here that at Washington Street Studios, for all of our cone six firings, when we first started out doing the firings with the kilns that we have, I was just going to a straight, I was doing a cone six, you know, a cone fire mode to a straight cone six. And I found out that we weren't getting as good uniformity of the glazes from the different parts of the kiln that I as I liked. So I went to a firing, the same, I, I, the same cone fire, but I went to a cone five, and then I added a 25 minute hold at the end. And that really improved the uniformity of the glazes that we got. We still got nice cone, cone six responses because by adding the 25 minute hold, I was essentially increasing the firing by one cone but it allowed the temperature to become more uniform and the response of the glazes was much better. And then I guess finally the other point to make that goes along with that is I really recommend firing with cones because cones, cones are a much better guide and a reference for your work than just using the temperature because the cones are responding the same way that the clay is. Okay, well that's all for today. I want to thank you all for, for joining us today. If you like the presentation, please like it and subscribe to our channel and share it with your friends and other potters. That's, help, that's that what's helped get our videos get noticed. Also check out our website at www.hfclay.com. We really want to thank our patrons for supporting our educational efforts such as these videos. If you'd like to help us, consider becoming a, Patreon, a patron. Go to patreon.com and look for the Potter's Roundtable.
We know this information was, was a lot in a short period of time, but if you'd like to hear it again, you can listen to our podcast version of this presentation. Just search for the Potter's Roundtable on your favorite podcast platform. And thank you again for joining us today. The Potter's Roundtable is brought to you by Washington Street Studios and our patrons. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and tell your friends. If you want to learn more about Washington Street Studios and shared studio memberships, please visit our website at www.hfclay.com. Thank you, and we'll see you again next time on the Potter's Roundtable.